Well, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, I ask you to grab them and open them up to Matthew chapter 5. We began a series uh, just a couple weeks ago, and last week we jumped into the first of the Beatitudes. So this week we are continuing with that, focusing on uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. Um, for the sake of hearing them repeated um, and hearing God's word proclaimed, I would, I would like for us to read beginning in Matthew chapter 5. We're going to read from verse 2 down to verse 12. God's word says this, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this word this morning. I ask that you would help us through your Holy Spirit to hear it and to believe it and to understand it. Enlighten our hearts and our minds, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I spent a lot of time over the last week um, thinking specifically about my parents, really my dad, because of Father's Day coming up. And for those of you who don't know, you may, maybe you've heard me say something like this before, I grew up in a house where my dad was a retired Marine. My mom was a teacher and an educator and then later became the principal, um, even it was at the school that I attended and so to say that my parents were professionals at sniffing out rule breaking is probably an understatement. They knew everything that I was gonna do and everything that I had done and probably knew about the plans I had made to break rules in the future. I was a pretty good kid, I think, for the most part, but I do remember the different kinds of disciplines and punishments and, and kind of, you know, uh, things that they would do to try to curb certain behaviors. I remember many of them. You guys probably are familiar with the same types of things. I mean, I experienced things like being grounded. Um, I had to do, you know, manual labor at the house and chores and dishes. And I mean, I, mean, was, I was assigned all of those things. But to be very honest with you, most of that stuff did very little to actually curb any of my plans. My, my thought process, even as a young kid, was, you know, I think I, think I can just take the spanking and move on and uh, I'll be okay, mom's not that strong. So I was okay with most of those punishments, but there was one, there was one, I, I, it's like the secret weapon of parenting that when they broke this one out, especially in, in talking with my dad, when, when they would break out this particular disciplinary measure, I knew two things. One, man, I have really stepped in it, and two, this actually works. And it's, it's something like this. I would do something or I would you know, get in trouble or I would break a rule that I knew was rule breaking and I wouldn't get disciplined with any kind of threat of force or I wouldn't have to add to chores lists. My dad would look at me and he would say something like, you know, I love you, son, but I'm really disappointed. I, I love you, but your actions in this way, it breaks my heart to see you do that. Or, or even, even the added twist of, you know, we didn't raise you to act that way. Oh, I tell you what, even as a teenager, when, my, when I had to look in my dad's eyes and he would have to say something like, son, your behavior in this way, that just breaks my heart because you're better than that and I've raised you better than that. I tell you what, that always got my attention. And it didn't get my attention because he was making any kind of threats. It didn't get my attention because I was afraid that the next step was some kind of severe punishment. It got my attention because I knew that my parents loved me and cared for me deeply. I knew they did. 
My parents, I, I was very fortunate. I had wonderful parents who were always there. They, I mean, they were at every event. They were at every basketball game, sent me to all the camps I wanted to go to. They cared for me. They fed me. They helped me. They picked me up. They taught me. They loved me. And so to hear that something that I had done was causing them to have heartache, oh, I was just cut deep. And that was the one thing that I feel like really worked in my life to curb the way that I behaved, to, to, ch to change me and to mature me into becoming a, a, a man, into becoming the person that I became. And I owe so much to them by God's grace that they taught me so many things through helping me understand how much they loved me and how important it was for them that I would grow up to be a mature person, a mature man. And with that being said, I would ask you this morning, do you, do you know that our sins and our sinful actions, that they grieve the heart of God? They grieve God. If we look in Ephesians chapter four, around, beginning around verse 15 through about 30, Paul is teaching about having new life in Christ. And what he's explaining is you need to put aside all of these sinful behaviors of your past life because God has rescued you and he's given you new life. And so live into this new life. Don't do these sinful things anymore. Put aside all the sinfulness of your old life and begin to live and experience new life. And then he kind of peaks it at this moment in Ephesians chapter four, verse 30, and he says, don't grieve the spirit. In other words, don't continue walking in a direction of sin and disobedience and therefore grieving the spirit of God who's working in you to give you a new life, to free you from sin and help you live in a different way. Psalm 78 verse 40 says, Speaking of Israel, how often they rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. And grieved him and, and heartbreaking as sin is because God knows that sin leads us to destruction, to pain, to death. But isn't it rather amazing, isn't it in fact incredible that even though we're sinful and even though we fall away, God continues to love us and care for us. He keeps us, he finds us, he draws us in, pulls us up out of the miry clay, sets our feet up on the rock. God recognizes when we're walking away from him, from him and yet even in our turning from him and our walking away, he continues to come after us and to love us and to care for us. My brothers and sisters, if we should be hurt and grieved in our hearts about the things that hurt and grieve the people who love us, like the way that it was with my parents, the things that I did grieved them and hurt them and caused them to have heartache for me on my behalf because of their incredible love for us, for me. Shouldn't we, in a similar fashion, shouldn't we be grieved and, and have heartache over the sins and the, the disobedience in the world, in our lives, that causes grief to our Father who loves us and with this kind of immense and unending, uninterruptible, continuous and eternal and powerful love. This wonderful God who sent us that even while we were enemies, he gave his life for us. And when he says that these things grieve me, these behaviors, these sins, they grieve me. And it's, and it's like God looks at us and says, I love you. You're my child. And I care for you so deeply. But this behavior, this sin that you're committing, it grieves my heart. And I want you to understand, because it grieves God's heart, because our sin grieves him, we should be grieved over it as well. And in a strange turn of events, Jesus tells us that not only should we mourn, but that it is a blessing, that, 
Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. It's incredible because it's countercultural, it's counterintuitive that mourning should be part of the way to true and lasting happiness. Now, I, I want to backtrack for just a moment because if you're joining us for the first time this week, you might be looking at these verses and asking yourself about how this connects with happiness. So let me just take a moment. We're studying these. This is the Beatitudes. They're, they're a series of proclamations about the people of God and, and how they are blessed. And they're very countercultural, as you can see. The people who are blessed are those who are poor in spirit, those who mourn, those who are persecuted, those who are the peacemakers. And we talked last week about how the word blessed could be translated into the word for us, meaning happy or happiness. So we could say happy are the poor in spirit and happy are those who mourn. We added just a little bit of depth to that, realizing that the word happy comes with a little bit of baggage, especially today. We, we don't quite fully understand the depth of what blessed means if we think only in terms of superficial happiness. So we added something to that, that real blessedness, true happiness in life, is when we live in ways that are approved by God. And these qualities, these things about the people who are God's people, they represent how we live and the kind of life that we live that will lead to happiness, true happiness, not just superficial happiness that's, that's filled with entertainment, but true happiness that comes from being in communion and connected with the Holy Spirit of God who works in us to live out in this way. And this is, goes completely against conventional human wisdom. Because human wisdom says something more like, live carefree. It says, don't be so worried about the sins, don't be so worried about sins of the world, just mind your own business, don't have any concern or any care. In fact, what they turn happiness into is this idea where happiness is only about what makes you feel good. Now we can already see how that's problematic because something that makes me feel good might only last for just a moment. Don't you feel that way when you've done something that you know is wrong, that's sinful, and you recognize it, but in the moment, the reason you committed it is because for a moment, even if just for a split second, it felt good. And you thought, ah, oh, just to have that feeling for just a moment, is it worth it? It's not worth it. But because our hearts can deceive us into doing things that feel good for the moment, we end up sinning against the holy God and doing things that we know are wrong because it feels good. Friends, happiness must go beyond simply what feels good in the moment. It has to. Because oftentimes that feel good in the moment, they feel awful for a long time after that. Simple mistakes made in the heat of emotional moments can cause you a lifetime worth of grief and pain. So we have to be aware of this. But, but beyond simply caring about how our feelings are, we even reduce happiness because, happiness because we want it to have no depth. We just want to be amused and, and, and we don't want to be we don't want to be confronted with sinfulness, so we turn everything into a joke. And what we're really trying to do is, is distract and turn our minds away from the truth about sin. We turn everything into a joke so that we can laugh it off. Because laughing often feels better, especially in the moment, than recognizing and confronting our sinfulness. When I look at my sin, I'm heartbroken. And I'm grieved, as I should be. But if I can turn it into a joke, if I can make it something amusing or funny, then it, it, it smooths it over for me. And, it, and here's the problem. It even makes it more likely that I'll continue to repeat that offense because I'm replacing what should be the true grief over my sin with something that sounds a lot more like fun and entertainment. And Proverbs 14.9 says, A fool laughs at sin. We have to recognize that sin can't just be a laughing matter for us. We can't just simply be entertained by sin. We can't just simply look at the wrong things in the world and figure out a way to make it, uh, make it like we can swallow it. 
And sometimes we feel like the only way I can even turn on the news and find out what's happening in current events is if there's something in between all of the devastation that makes me giggle so I can get through it, so I can wake up another day. And so we pursue that. But as paradoxical as it sounds, as strange as it sounds, we need mourning in our life. We need to know and understand and experience the grief over sin in our life. It's important. Ecclesiastes 3, 4 says, there is a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. Well, of course we wanna experience joy We don't want to just be sticks in the mud. We don't want to be wet blankets every week. We don't want to be those people who are just constantly frowning, you know, Eeyore types. Oh, well, sin's bad. I can't even stop it, so I may as well just cry. We don't want to be like that, right? We want to experience joy in our life. As a matter of fact, a fruit of the Spirit is joy, Right? I mean, we want to enjoy things and love and laugh, but we can't do it at the expense of a right time to mourn, at a right time to weep. Have you ever been with someone who struggles with this? It's like, it's like the person who can't face any kind of difficulty without having to turn it into something goofy or funny. They struggle with uncomfortable emotions, sadness. They struggle with expressions. Now, it's Father's Day, so I want to point out something as I'm seeing many of the men kind of refusing to nod their heads. Guys aren't known for being the most sentimental, emotionally sensitive, empathetic type of people. Oftentimes, we are known being, for being more stoic, even in the face of problems or in the face of things like death. We want to hold it together. We, we give this excuse, we say like, I've gotta hold it together, I've gotta be strong. Brothers, let me free you from that. You've also gotta mourn. You've got a responsibility to mourn. Mourn over sin, mourn over grief. I, and I thought about this this morning. One of the problems that we continue to see in our world today, in our society, is this issue of mental health. Now, specifically, we keep seeing, and pardon the language, we continue to see young men shooting up and killing people on a regular basis. And afterwards, we can have as many political discussions and fights as we want, but until we get to the root of the problem, that one, it has to do something with mental health, and that much seems clear, but it also has to do with the heart and understanding of sin. It's a heart problem. But I'm gonna tell you, Ladies, gentlemen, we need to mourn sin. How is this connected to mental health? Have you ever bottled up emotions for decades? Have you ever met someone that's done that? That's just struggled and struggled and struggled, but rather than actually mourning over the sin, mourning over the things that they're struggling with, rather than just letting it out and just giving it a good old-fashioned cry, we suck it up and we move on. And, and worse yet, that's kind of the message that we give to men a lot. Friends, Jesus wept. He wept at the grave of Lazarus. He was getting ready to bring Lazarus back from the dead and yet he wept. We gotta weep. It's okay. It's okay to weep. In fact, I would encourage you, if you need to get a good cry out, stay afterwards, we can cry together. I'm not even joking, I'm being serious. I would rather you weep over sin. I would rather you let it out. Have a group of men or have a group of women who you can go and you can be honest with and you can tell them the things that you're struggling and suffering with. Don't let it turn into a, an issue, a mental health struggle where you're fighting on your own trying to keep it all in. That's not worth it. Let's change that in our society. We would never do that with, we, we prayed over our young, our young boys and girls this morning. We would never do that with them in Sunday school. We would never tell them to just bottle it up. When they get hurt, when they're tired, when they're frustrated, and they're just, they can't withhold their emotions anymore, we don't chastise them. What do we do? We care for them. We pick them up. We take them by the hand. We hold them. We say, it's okay. It's okay. It's all right. It'll be okay. We got you. I'm here. I'm here for you. Let's say that to one another too. Let's take a moment and let's look at our brothers and sisters and recognize when they're struggling 
and, and, and go and just ask and try and plead. Let me be here. Let me help you. If you need to get a good cry in, let me know. We can get a mirror and do the ugly cry in the mirror thing that everybody knows you've all done. Everybody's done it. It's no shame. I'm sorry that that's just a side note that I thought of. I was thinking of it this morning, but I thought it was appropriate. It was worth mentioning. There's got to be a connection between our refusal to mourn over sin and our continued struggles with mental health and depression and anxiety. But let's continue with mourning. Specifically, what kind of mourning is Jesus talking about? Is, is, he, is he speaking of all kinds of mourning, including things like mourning at funerals? Is this, is this mourning over a lost job? Is this mourning over all of my issues? Or are there any kind of specific, narrow-focused things that we should be mourning over? First of all, let's just say, it's okay to mourn when you lose a job or when you lose a family member or when you have any other thing going on in your life that naturally calls you into a state of mourning. Let's just go ahead and set that out. That's okay. But let's also narrow our focus because I think, especially in light of the first beatitude, that we recognize that we're poor in spirit, that what Jesus has in mind here is that as we've recognized how bankrupt we are spiritually and how we've sinned and how we've fallen short, that we mourn over specifically sins. We mourn over three different kinds of sins that I'm gonna talk about this morning. We mourn over the effects of sin, we mourn over our personal sins, our individual sins, and we mourn for the sins in the world. We mourn over the effects of sin. All the way back in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth and he put Adam in the garden and he was giving Adam instructions, in Genesis 2, verse 17, he tells him, you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat, you will certainly die. Romans chapter six tells us that the wages of sin is death. In fact, the first and foremost effect of sin is death. Now, we're still here, we've sinned, but we're still continuing to breathe. Of course, our bodies continue to live, though they, they begin to decay. The, the sins around us, the brokenness of nature, the brokenness of the world begins to take its effect on us. We only live for so long, and then we die. And then he goes after that, after, after the fall in the garden, and, and you have these long lists of names. You notice that every name says something like, this person lived, and they lived this long, and then they died. And then this person lived, and they lived this long, and then they died. And it continues and continues and continues. The first and foremost effect of our sin in the world is that it causes death. Spiritual death, sure, and physical death as well. And we should mourn for the death. God didn't create us to die. When he created us and we were created good and in his image and placed into the garden, we were meant to have life and have it abundantly in communion with God. We weren't meant to be disobedient and sin and fall and enter into death and have it just completely destroy the whole world. Because there's other effects of sin, such as things like being separated from God. Right from the beginning, as God casts them out of the garden, they're separated from his presence. And we recognize that we are born into this separation, separated from God, completely and spiritually incapable of reaching God, so far separated from God that he had to go on a rescue mission. He had to send his only son to come to us to give his life in order to provide the way. As Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The way to life is Jesus Christ because we are separated from God. We are dead and separated and our relationships are broken. We need reconciliation even in our relationships here. Consider how much talk God says about being united through the Spirit. Isn't it a blessing in itself that when God rescues us, he rescues sinners out of, out of the darkness and he creates new hearts within us, he not only gives us an individual life, he brings us into the fellowship of the body and he unites us in spirit. And then we strive with one another to be united together as a body of Christ, moving into the world, representing God's kingdom and love and care for people, sharing the gospel, showing people what it can look like to be reconciled, not just to God, but to one another. 
That's what the picture of the church is supposed to be. It's supposed to be us loving and caring and comforting and being there for one another and look into the person to your left and right and if you don't know them, you go talk to them because at least what we can do is try to see how important it is for the world to know you're broken, friends, world. Outside of our walls just here this morning, there's a lot of people continuing to drive by and they don't even recognize the power of the Holy Spirit as he can come to us, transform us, and bring us into a new family of people who love and care for us. It's Father's Day and I, know, I recognize fully that many of you may not have a great relationship with your father. You may not even have a relationship with your father. Maybe you didn't even know who your father was. Maybe you knew him and you'd prefer not to have known him. Brothers and sisters, when you are brought into the, the faith, when you are made a believer, when the Holy Spirit works in your heart, not only do you gain a heavenly father who loves you perfectly, but you also gain a whole family of brothers and sisters. And we all sit here at this table together and we all look to our father in heaven. We need a powerful reminder of the reconciliation that God offers us through his Holy Spirit. And we have to stand on that for one another. We have to. It's, we must. If we don't show the world what true reconciliation and unity in the Spirit can look like, they're not going to know it. They're not going to see it. It's a picture of the gospel. But not only do we have death and separation from God and our relationships suffer and are broken, even the earth itself, even the, the nature and creation cry out. Isaiah 24 says, the earth mourns and withers, the world languishes and withers. Sin has affected all aspects of creation. It's affected our, uh, us, it's affected our hearts, it's affected our nature, it's affected the ground, it's affected our labor and relationships no one can escape the pains of sin in the world. Its effects are all around us, causing chaos and destruction and war and violence and persecution. The effects of sin are cause for mourning. But, this is a big, important caveat, our mourning is meaningless unless we realize that sin begins in our hearts. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. If we don't realize that sin comes from out of our hearts, then we're just mourning to mourn. We haven't been convicted of sin yet. We are not poor in spirit. All we do is recognize the unhappiness of the world and we're not moved into any kind of repentance. We have to realize that sin begins in our hearts. If the first beatitude is the intellectual assent, if the first beatitude is a recognition of the knowledge of my sin, the second beatitude is the appropriate emotional response to that knowledge. It's the appropriate emotional response. Do you realize that one of the steps, one of the, one of the most important things you can do in overcoming sin in your life is hating sin more than you love it and enjoy it? We spoke a moment ago about enjoying things for a moment. And we all have probably those things in our lives that we know, I want to stop doing this, but right now it just still causes pleasure in my life. Mourning and being grieved over that sin is one of the ways that God helps us to overcome sin. Do you recognize that? Isn't that a powerful way to help you stop doing something? I don't typically do things that I hate doing. If I really don't enjoy something, if something just causes me physical or emotional distress and pain, I try to avoid it. And it's the same way with sin. As God works in your hearts and begins to convict you of sin, he's helping you to hate your sin. We can't do this without the power of the Holy Spirit working in us. He works through an incredible means, but he does something more than just cause us to hate sin. He works through an even more powerful means to rescue us from sin. Think about this. God doesn't just slap you on the wrist every time you sin. Now, you may experience pain from sin, and of course, sin has its effects, but God does something else. As God works in your heart, he's not only causing you to dislike the things that happen because of your sin, 
He's causing you to love Jesus and to love his word. And as we begin to understand and know God's love for us because the Holy Spirit is enlightening the truth of the scriptures, the truth of the gospel, the truth about Jesus, the truth about his love for us, as we begin to understand the immensity and the power and the miraculous nature of God's love for us, it causes us to not want to sin. It causes us to grieve our sin. It causes us to to think twice when God says, I love you, I love you so much that I came and I rescued you, but your sin, it's, it's grieving my heart. We can see an example of this. In John chapter 21, beginning in verse 15, we have post-resurrection Jesus meeting with his disciples. And specifically, he's talking in conversation with the apostle Peter, with the disciple Peter. Now, Peter was one of Jesus' closest companions. He was within the trio of men who were, who were in Jesus' inner circle. But, as you probably know, Jesus, on the night that, or Paul, or it's one of those guys, Maybe I don't know. Peter, everybody say Peter. Peter, Peter, on the night that Jesus was arrested, what did he do? He denied his Lord three times. Three times Peter denies even knowing him. Not only his Lord and Savior, but his friend, the man that he had spent years with, living with, Traveling with, hearing his preaching, being loved and cared for by, being corrected and rebuked and and trained and, and led up. And Peter turns and says, I don't know him. And so Jesus now, resurrected, is sitting across from Peter. And three times, three times he looks at Peter and what does he say? Peter, do you love me? And the first time he asks it, Peter says, of course, yeah, I love you. And he asks him again, he says, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yes, I love you. And then Jesus asks him a third time. Now, I don't think this is lost on Peter. It's not lost the connection here. I denied my Lord three times. And here he is looking at me, asking me three times, do you love me? You can almost imagine the heartbreak and the suffering that in that moment Peter is considering and he's thinking about and he's being grieved over this situation. It even says, Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And it says what? Peter's response, he was grieved. He's thinking about it. And all he can look at and say is, Jesus, you know everything. You know everything. You know I love you. Grieved over his sin, mourned over his sin, and all he can do is look and respond and just say, I don't have excuses, Lord. I love you. Notice Jesus' response. He doesn't discipline him. He doesn't say, okay, that's good. I understand. All right, you're out. You're out of the group. You're not the team captain anymore. Give me back your jersey. Now he looks at Peter, what does he say? Feed my sheep. He doesn't rebuke him. He gives him a mission. He doesn't cast him out. He puts him in position to go and to save more people. I'm telling you, I think that moment was so vital for Peter to be confronted with his grief to be confronted with the fact that he had denied his Savior and to be immediately cared for and comforted. And isn't that the promise of the blessing? Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And Peter is mourning, he's grieved. Lord, of course I love you. And then he's comforted by an incredible Savior. So we mourn the effects of sin, we mourn our personal sins, and finally, we mourn the sins of the world. Psalm 119, 136 says, my eyes shed streams of tears because your people 
do not keep your law. And we don't need a lot of explanation for this because we see it all over the place. We see it everywhere around us. It's tragic. It's heartbreaking because society doesn't mourn sin. It celebrates sin. Society doesn't mourn sin. It turns sin into big business. It doesn't mourn sin. It brushes it under the rug. It doesn't mourn sin. It runs to sin. John 3, 19 says, the light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of the light because their deeds were evil. We desperately need a revival, do we not? We desperately need a revival of the Holy Spirit working in the hearts and minds of, of the people around our community, around our nation, around our world to turn them and to convict them of sin, that they would mourn sin and begin to walk away from sin, to grieve over sin, to be moved by sin. And as I thought about this, I thought, especially this year, we're in a midterm election year, as many of you probably are aware. I'm gonna, I wanna give you early advice, not a political speech on who to vote for. I'm gonna give you early advice on something that I think we need to look for in the men and women that we elect to lead our country. Here's what it is. I want you to look for the people who are mourning over sin. That's who we want to put in office because our problems are not political. Our problems are not simply economic. Our problems are heart problems. Our problems are sin problems. And we desperately, we desperately need leaders who are mourning over sin. Consider that this year. Consider that. The greatest revival in the history of the world was in Nineveh. Under the preaching and prophetic ministry of the prophet of Jonah, the prophet Jonah. I did not know when I came up with this illustration there would be water in front of me. That's just coincidental. Jonah walked into Nineveh, a wicked place, wicked, filled with sin. He did it reluctantly. And he preached a message that said, you're all gonna be destroyed. And Jonah didn't wanna be there, so I have a feeling he said it probably just like that. You're gonna be destroyed. God's tired of your sin. He's gonna come here. He's gonna, he's gonna blow this whole place down. You guys, you're going down. Deal with it. God's wrath is coming. Get ready. Now, most of the time when people read the story of Jonah, what is the most miraculous thing we focus on? He got what? Swallowed by a fish. And we put all of our time, effort, and energy into talking about how that's possible, it's impossible, with God everything's possible, but he couldn't have really, well, was he alive, was he dead? I'm telling you, the most incredible miracle in the book of Jonah was not him spending three days in the belly of the fish. Now, you might be thinking, wait a minute, uh, Kyle, yes, it is, that's an incredible miracle. It's, it's fascinating, it's, it's, one, it's amazing. How did he even survive that? I'm telling you, the most incredible miracle in the book of Jonah was not the story of the fish, it's the story of Nineveh completely repenting from the greatest to the least, putting on sackcloth, sitting in ashes. The, the kingdom turned completely from sin, completely and they mourned, and they wept over their sin, and they grieved over their sin. Even the animals were ordered to wear sackcloth. I don't even, I, animals are probably like, I wear this every day, what's the difference? Everybody turned. Now you're thinking like, is that really the biggest miracle? I don't know, you tell me. What would it look like if suddenly the entire country, well let's, let's even simplify it down to this, not even just the whole United States. What if just the city of Chicago, what if, what if we sent a prophet into the city of Chicago and they said, because of the destruction and the violence of this city, because of the continuous murders and the, the skyrocketing crime, God is gonna come to Chicago and he's gonna destroy this entire city. Get ready, 40 days, it's coming. Now what after that message was preached, the entire city puts on sackcloth, sits in ashes, and turns and repents. Not just a part of the city, not like one block, not one decent neighborhood, the whole city, the gangs, the violent criminals, the murderers, those in the prisons, the animals, the dogs are even out in the streets sharing the road with the cats. Everybody turns and repents. We would look at that and say, that is the most incredible and miraculous thing I've ever seen in my entire life. And that's what happened in Nineveh. The people mourned over their sin. It was fascinating, it was miraculous. It was miraculous. 
And God even confirms that it was, it was real mourning. It wasn't just for show. Because he says, when God saw how they turned from their evil way, he relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them. We often see when, you know, these horrific school shootings happen, when a war starts, when something happens worldwide, what happens? We, we see, this is all the time, and it's so frustrating. For like three days, the whole world puts a flag on their Facebook picture. And they say, pray for Afghanistan. This was a year ago, folks. Is there, does anybody remember what happened in Afghanistan about a year ago? How suddenly all of the American armed forces were, were pulled away from Afghanistan and the people that were left behind were so devastated because they knew what was coming. They knew now we're gonna be tortured and killed. And they were holding on to the wheels of an airplane to try to escape. Now, you, you know holding on to that, that's not gonna work. But they would rather die falling from an aircraft than continue living in a place where they know they're gonna be horrifically persecuted. Now, do you think between a year ago and today that that persecution has just stopped? But we don't hear about it anymore, do we? It's not a news cycle, guys. It's real life. But that's not what Nineveh had. They had mourning and turning from their sin. And it was true heart, Holy Spirit-powered repentance that caused them to stop and turn. This is what we desperately need. This is the kind of mourning we desperately, desperately need today. The kind of mourning that causes us to stop on a dime and recognize that if we continue down this sinful path, we are headed for destruction. And folks, not just destruction here in our little neck of the woods in Northeast Indiana, eternal destruction forever. Now all of this talk about mourning, you might, you might be convinced that the blessing is mourning itself, but the blessing isn't specifically tied directly to being mournful. What does it say? It says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. It's the promise of comfort. That's where the blessing, the happiness of our life comes from. That's where God buries within our hearts an understanding that even though we mourn today, all of the tears will be wiped from our eyes in the, in the eternity, in the eternal kingdom. In Luke chapter four, Jesus goes into a synagogue saying, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. And what Jesus was doing there is he was actually reading from a scroll from the book of Isaiah, chapter 61, the first few verses. I'd like to read those to you this morning. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. How sweet is the comfort that our Lord gives us. And notice how these few verses tie together even the first two Beatitudes, that Christ comes for the poor. He comes and he rescues those who are poor, especially those who are poor in spirit, and he comforts all who mourn because he came to rescue us. And what does Christ offer us? He cleanses all of our filthiness. He wipes the ash from our faces. All of our cries will be turned to joy. All of our despair is turned to worship. Though we mourn, Christ comforts us through the forgiveness of our sins, through the hope of salvation, through the reconciliation and joy of knowing that God takes us back even when we have fallen away from him. We have comfort and joy at the glory set before us in anticipation of the hope of eternal life. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ who saves us and comforts us. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much this morning for giving us a word. We continue to pray, God, that you would help us. I do ask, Father, that you would comfort those who mourn this morning, that you would 
work powerfully in our lives and in, in, in our hearts, that you would help us to trust and know you and, and to believe in your promises and to believe in your word. Thank you, Father. And thank you, God, for all the men here this morning, especially those who are, who are the dads. May we just continue to love them and care for them. May we also care for our families. And God, we do pray for our children that they would hear your message, God, and that they would believe. We lift all these things up to you, Father, and we trust you completely. In Jesus' name, amen.